Welcome back to today's video. Today is Sunday, July 23rd, 2023, and today we are going to be talking about a potential vice presidential nomination selection process for President Donald Trump in the upcoming 2024 presidential election. Now, 11 months ago, I made a video talking about the 2024 potential VP nominee picks for President Donald Trump. And that's because 11 months ago, it was a very good point for Donald Trump in the Republican 24 presidential nomination polling numbers. You can see around this point last year, the GOP had a pretty clear frontrunner. It was President Donald Trump who had been leading by roughly 30 points nationally. We can see that on this exact day, one year ago, Donald Trump had a 32-point advantage over Governor Ron DeSantis. A bit of a mute point here for Ron DeSantis that he was at a higher point uh, 12 months ago than he is today, despite not even being an announced candidate 12 months ago. But 11 months ago, the numbers aren't exactly that much better for Ron DeSantis or any other candidate. So around that period of time, it looked very clear that Donald Trump was on track to be the 2024 nomination. Even though nobody had announced, including him in this race, because he announced following the 2022 midterm elections, we had a very general idea of how this race was going to go. Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump were going to be top two, and pretty much everybody else was going to fail to crack double digits across the 2024 race. Today, it stands roughly the exact same, but so much has happened far and in between this period of time. Republicans had an inconsequential midterm election where Republicans actually did worse in the Senate than they did prior to, and Democrats did quite well in the House despite the GOP winning back House control. Following that, the amount of support for Donald Trump dropped tremendously. The first polling done following his announcement saw a dip in support from him. What was a 31-point advantage was immediately cut in half down to an 18-point advantage. As we head into the new year, we saw that Ron DeSantis was being propped up more and more by Republican uh, you know, voters, Republican media, whatever it might be. And Donald Trump's lead went down to being just 12 points nationally against the Florida governor. From then, Donald Trump launched a series of attacks against Ron DeSantis that has propelled him back up to a very strong point of victory, a higher point than where he was one year ago today prior to being even a candidate in the race. Ron DeSantis, as I said previously, performing even worse. So looking at the 2024 general election, we're starting to see a lot more discussion about a Donald Trump Joe Biden rematch. A rematch election that I'm sure many Americans either do or do not want, depending on what side of the aisle you're on. And looking at this matchup here, it becomes increasingly and increasingly more likely that it is an absolute as we get into just six months from now, the Iowa caucus time frame, you know, the New Hampshire primary time frame, Nevada primary, South Carolina primary, very important uh, times for the Republican nomination that will probably assure that Donald Trump is renominated for the third time in a row for the GOP nomination. Now, with that comes a lot of responsibility about winning the general election, and choosing the right candidate is always so important. For this uh, tier list here, we are going to be taking into consideration the way that voters view these candidates on the GOP side, so their approval rating, the way that voters would be inspired by them, wanting to see them work together, collaborate, is always going to be very important, and also the personal relationships between these candidates too. You know, Donald Trump is a very polarizing figure, even in his own party, and has alienated many members of the party as well. We'll compare it to how my map was, or not my map, my tier list was 11 months ago because it will be quite interesting, and we'll adjust this over time as we start to get closer and closer to the assured domination of President Donald Trump. But it's interesting to see where things were a year ago in terms of perception from me, from many others, and why that's so important to see the difference between then versus now, and how some things may have even stayed consistent, and how there are general trends and general politics politicians that might be most electable for Donald Trump. Of course, electability is always going to be in consideration. Do these people add to the ticket? Do they take away? Do they have scandals that would weigh down Donald Trump's ticket even more so than the three-time now indicted president? Or will they help him? Will they counteract the way that Mike Pence did in 2016, provide more of a presidential lens? All of these things will be taken into consideration. I won't mention all of them because, again, keep in mind they'll be taken in as an underlying layer. But they'll be important because I think that they will be points of interest when it comes down to this tier list. Now, unfortunately, this list doesn't have everybody that I'm considering. It has everybody but one, Vivek Ramaswamy, who is currently polling roughly third, fourth place nationally in the polls. And he's at a point where he is doing quite well nationally, but isn't making much of a name for himself outside of these polls that are propped up by Fox News and other organizations. But he certainly is getting his name thrown around Republican circles, Republican donor circles that see that he can self-fund his campaign, adds a lot to a ticket, and isn't exactly this stereotypical career politician 
position that everybody else is. He's a very different dynamic type of candidate, which is the reason why, as someone who was a no-name a year ago, is building a name for himself, building a brand for himself, potentially for a future launching pad of a Republican nomination, not necessarily presidential, but maybe on the Senate level, the House level. He's from the state of Ohio uh, and currently is in a good point uh, for 2024 when it comes down to potential VP consideration. I definitely think that the Trump campaign is looking into him as a possibility. I don't think he's super high up there, but we'll talk about his possibility at the end just because he doesn't have uh, a picture on this screen here. So here we are with many candidates. We're going to speed run them. I've taken too much of your time by talking. So let's go to get started. We're going to go in a reverse order. We'll start down on, uh, actually, no, we'll start with the standard order because I want to get to Ron DeSantis near the end. But we'll start off with a very big hitter, who is Brian Kemp, the 2022 reelected governor from the state of Georgia, who won by a pretty substantial margin across the state. Uh, the way that these rankings go, S tier is the highest, F being the lowest. And again, a lot of this has to do, keep in mind, because you will see it with Brian Kemp, though I think Brian Kemp is an electable candidate. I'm going to give him about a C to B rating just because I think, sure, he brings in the state of Georgia. I don't think he provides much more electability outside of that. But he also doesn't have a good relationship with Donald Trump. It's about inspiring your base. It's about unifying a party. And while Brian Kemp might represent the disgruntled version of the GOP that doesn't exactly approve of Donald Trump's uh, election denialism, I don't think he brings them in too heavily either. He very much was on track to be aligned with Donald Trump leading up to the election. And then once Donald Trump started to attack him, started to push against him, I really don't think Brian Kemp is this all-encompassing, super strong candidate outside of Georgia, which is why he doesn't get a D or F rating. But I think the candidate dynamics here would be very, very wonky. Now, Elise Stefanik, currently serving in House leadership, one of the top-ranking Republicans across the United States, was practically a nobody, you know, New York Republican, a moderate at the point. Now she is much more on track for future, uh, uh, a future in politics. She potentially could be seen as a strong nominee for Donald Trump on the VP spot. I think she provides a good balance to Donald Trump. I think she aligns very closely with his side of the aisle, which is good, but not necessarily for bringing in, again, that disgruntled portion of the GOP that would be necessary to win the election in 2024 against Donald uh, against Joe Biden. I think that Elise Stefanik is individually a very strong person. I think she could be a strong candidate in the future. As of right now, though, I don't exactly see her as this all-encompassing, very strong VP nominee. Glenn Youngkin, on the other hand, I would actually rank to be in the S tier. It's a very strong start for the Virginia governor. He did what many of these other Republicans failed to do. There are candidates on here who lost their last elections, and many of them who are too polarizing. Glenn Youngkin had a uniquely uh, well-oiled machine when he ran for governor in 2021. He took a Biden plus 10 state and turned it into a Republican plus two state. Flipped the House of Delegates, which was a large majority for the Democratic Party, uh, gave the Republicans victories in the attorney general's race and the lieutenant governor's races. Those were all elected separately from the governorship. He did a tremendous thing for Republicans down ballot, and he's on track to do so again, it seems, in 2023. Now, we will see how strong his influence is. He's a popular governor in Virginia, though there's no denying that. Poll after poll shows him in the positive when it comes down to net approval, which means that as a Republican, he's appealing to a blue state. And I think he has provided himself the level of cover as a Republican that isn't closely associated with Donald Trump, but didn't exactly push him away in a way that turned off his voters. He he represents one of the perfect potential VP nominees, and I think he could do very well when it comes down to the 2024 race alongside Donald Trump. J.D. Vance, don't you know, we don't really need to uh, entertain this much. I think he ranks down in the D or F tier. I don't think that he provides really anything else besides uh, the fact that he is a senator from Ohio. That is the only thing I could see going for him outside of that. He's not electable. He's not a super strong candidate. I think ultimately he's one of the, uh, you know, worst GOP fielded, uh, you know, candidates for 2022. He just so happened to be in a red state. J.D. Vance would not add anything nationally, and in fact, I think he would take away, but he does have a slight electoral benefit of being from Ohio, thus the D rating and not the F rating. Now, Joe Lombardo, I would say, ranks up in the A tier. I don't put him in the S tier because I don't think he's on uh, par with Glenn Youngkin. Otherwise, he would have won Nevada by more. But he did do what many of the Republicans could not in the 2022 midterm elections, and that was flip a state from red to blue. You can see on the governor level in 2022, Nevada went red. It was decided by 1.5% against the incumbent Democrat, Steve Sisolak. One, he took down an incumbent, and this was alongside the same map that you saw the House election results, for instance, go to the Democrats 3 to 1, alongside the same map that the Senate elections went to the Democrats by 0.78%. He won the state amongst the same group of voters that voted for Democrats on the House level and the Senate level, but were willing to elect him on the governor level. I think he could bring that level of expertise, especially being from a swing state, into the national fray, but I don't give him an S-tier rating because he didn't do the impossible. Glenn Youngkin absolutely did. So, 
where we are right now, uh, Joe Lombardo in the A tier, uh, Glenn Youngkin in the S tier. Those are the only two candidates I think are in heavy consideration. So let's go ahead and get continued. Joni Ernst, I don't think really provides much. Again, she's from Iowa, but generally speaking, isn't going to be this all-encompassing, super strong candidate, aligns from the same sector of the party. And while she is from a previous swing state, there isn't much I think would be inspirational. I think that she would be a very strong first woman VP nominee for the uh, mainstream candidate, Carly Fiorina for Ted Cruz in 2016, but she wasn't the nominee uh, for vice president. But I think she could be somewhat strong. I don't think she is up there and I don't think she should be. Moving on to Josh Hawley in the state of Missouri, I think he probably ranks amongst one of the lowest. I say D because he probably could do, you know, good in terms of speaking. I think that he has, uh, you know, good oration skills. But beyond that, he doesn't have much to add to the ticket. He's from a not battleground state. He's from Missouri. He provides a lot of pushback on January 6th, something that Donald Trump is already going to have to tackle, depending on who his VP nominee is going to be. Right now, I would say D tier, if not F tier. But the F tier is reserved for candidates, I think, are going to be amongst the absolute worst and would drag down the ticket tremendously. And that goes to the next candidate being Kerry Lake, the candidate from 2022 who refuses to concede the governor election in the state of Arizona, continues to hammer in this point, the false point, that she won the governorship against Katie Hobbs. I think it's really hard for her to understand how she lost to uh, Katie Hobbs. But beyond that, I really think she has made such a bad name for herself, being the Donald Trump of Arizona, but even worse. She's more extreme. She's more, uh, you know, bold, more emboldened by her, you know, loss in the governorship and now might even weigh down the GOP in the 2024 Arizona Senate race. But I can imagine even worse reality where she's chosen as VP and drags down not only Arizona, but quite literally every other state in the union by her being on the ticket. Not helpful, not good, and would be probably one of the worst political moves that Donald Trump could make in 2024. Kim Reynolds is going to get the same characterization as Joni Ernst. There isn't much here. I think the hype around these two people is just the fact that they are from the state of Iowa, but beyond that, they don't provide much. Joni Ernst and, you know, Kim Reynolds are from previous battleground states, but they aren't going to be competitive in 2024. Donald Trump will win them regardless, and he doesn't need them to carry them across the finish line, to carry him across the finish line again in an already red state. Not to mention Kim Reynolds just signed a six-week abortion ban, which doesn't exactly resonate well amongst the American public, where you have 60 to 70 percent, depending on the poll, that are in favor of Roe v. Wade, that are in favor of legalized abortion up to a limit but certainly not up to six weeks. It's incomprehensible to think how that would be translatable to an electable point nationally because it isn't. Quite frankly, it is a losing point and would lose in nearly every state across the country as we've seen abortion bans fail in Kansas. Uh, we've seen them ba uh, fail in Kentucky. We've seen them fail across the nation. And to put that as one of the mainstream candidates nationally, Donald Trump has provided some cover, though he did overturn Roe v. Wade, that he has not supported a national ban. I have no doubt in my mind that Kim Reynolds would or that her six-week ban in her state would be translated to an attack ad for Democrats nationally. Uh, Christy Noem, I think she would do well as a candidate roughly around the B tier. I don't think that she is uh, as propped up as she was previously. I think that her hype also was just very much, you know, there for the fact that she was this outspoken critic of COVID policy, outspoken critic of many Democratic policies, but she's from South Dakota. It's not a state that provides much electoral benefit. And in terms of her as a person, she hasn't exactly had the strongest electoral history in the years past. In 2018, she almost lost to a Democrat across the state of South Dakota, across the state that Donald Trump wins by routinely 20 to 30 points. So to see her in this position, I think that she might provide a level of uh, presidentialism across the national ballot, a balance to Donald Trump's uh, overindulgence in non-political correctness. But I do think that she still has baggage. And I don't think she is this super strong Republican as I once did. I thought that she would even be a presidential candidate. But at this point, I don't think she ranks in my top uh, five. Uh, Marshall Blackburn, I would say D tier. There isn't much here. She is just probably even more right wing than Donald Trump. She's from Tennessee. Again, I don't see much there either. Uh, candidate dynamics, though, I think Marsha Blackburn would work well with Donald Trump, as would Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance. But again, national perception is more important than just candidate dynamics, though it's still a very important point. Mike Pence, I would say, probably ranks in the F tier right now. And, you know, I say this not because I think that Mike Pence is not a strong candidate on his own. I think I could see a reality that he defeats Joe Biden. But at the same time, with Donald Trump as someone who called him practically everything but a traitor, there would be no enthusiasm for that ticket. Mike Pence has been ostracized by the GOP, has been vilified by mainstream Republicans, and it's really hard to walk that back. You look disingenuous. You look like you're just looking for an opportunity for renomination. And quite frankly, Donald Trump doesn't need him. He does not need Mike Pence on his ticket, and it would probably do a disservice to inspiring the base, unifying the GOP, because Mike Pence probably doesn't represent that disgruntled portion of the GOP because he was only anti-Trump when it became convenient. There are voters out there that can be captured in 
buy Glenn Youngkin, buy Joe Lombardo, who were previously, yes, anti-Trump and may still be anti-Trump, which is why they're captured in. But also these candidates haven't angered the Trump wing in a way that makes them un recognizable to be as a potential VP nominee. Mike Pence absolutely has. Mike Pompeo, also as a potential candidate, I think he would be fine. I don't think he'd defeat Joe Biden, but I think, you know, in some realities, you could see him do a little bit better than Donald Trump at some states, given that he's less problematic, but he's less enthusiastic. I don't think he would add anything to the ticket, which is why I give him a D rating. Uh, really not much there. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, I'm just going to say F tier. I don't think much explanation is needed. Just look into any of her comments. Literally just watch her speak on the House floor live and you'd understand why I give her an F rating. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene right now stands to be one of the worst potential GOP uh, VP knobs, even though she is very openly seems to have been making a play for that VP spot. Many Republicans have considered her in possibility. I, you know, pray for the sake of the Trump campaign that they did not uh, consider her as a potential VP because she would drag down that ticket even more tremendously, I would argue, than Carrie Lake would. And that's saying something. So F tier for her. Uh, candidate dynamics, I'm sure it'd work out, but I don't think strongly. So uh, we're going to go ahead and keep her in the F tier. She's already angered the House GOP caucus, just got kicked out of the House Freedom Caucus. So again, I'm not too, uh, you know, solid on the front that she would be this super strong candidate. Nikki Haley, however, I still give that S tier rating. I know I've gotten some pushback from you guys for this characterization, but I do think Nikki Haley provides, uh, surprisingly enough, this unique appeal of moderatism that doesn't really exist. She was a Trump administration official. She was a South Carolina governor, but she really wasn't this moderate Republican, though she does have that reputation. I do think that also she is an amazing speaker. I think she has provided that idea of presidentialism across her campaign, and I think it will be something that would translate to a balance for Donald Trump in the way that Glenn Youngkin would. I just don't know if he would choose her, considering that she's running against him. But Donald Trump hasn't said much negative about her, and neither has she about him. She also gave him a heads up when she decided she was going to run. She announced publicly a year ago that she wouldn't run should Donald Trump run, but seems to be vying for that potential second place spot. She seems to be reaffirming consistently that she's not running for second place. She wants to be the nominee, but realistically speaking, she'd probably best off be VP, uh, potentially a 2028 presidential contender. But right now she's not polling too hot. I don't think that she'd be in a strong position to overtaking Donald Trump by any metric or even Ron DeSantis. Uh, but generally speaking, I think she would be a very strong VP nominee, especially given the points of reference compared to all the other Republicans that I've ranked below her. Rand Paul, I think, was that potential candidate from the years past that people think might be electable, might add to the ticket from Kentucky, not a swing state. But I think, you know, he's fine. I think he's mediocre at best. I really don't understand the hype around him that was there in 2014, 2015. Uh, but, you know, those elections were vastly different than they are now. I think there are many other candidates that are a lot better, and I don't think, you know, he is amongst the strongest. Ron DeSantis, he's someone that I used to be considering an S-tier candidate, an A-tier candidate at the weakest. And I'd say in terms of candidate dynamics now, he probably gets around a B rating. He's from the state of Florida, but Donald Trump, again, is probably going to win it anyways. And I don't think that he has this electability that he promised to his donors, to his voters, that should be there for a candidate like himself. I mean, Ron DeSantis on his own doesn't seem to be performing too well across the nation, whether it's with the GOP, whether it's with the Democrats, whether it's with swing states. I mean, literally, Ron DeSantis has turned into this candidate that was so, so hyped up, even by myself, you know, going out there saying Ron DeSantis is the strongest GOP candidate out there, if not one of the strongest. Regardless, though, you know, he's not we were wrong. I mean, Ron DeSantis has proven time and time again that someone who was so, so, so hyped up, such in a strong position prior to where he is now, is now no longer leading too well. And there are voters out there that are answering these general election ballots between Trump uh, and Biden and DeSantis and Biden that are saying they would vote for Biden over DeSantis or they just wouldn't vote because they are Trump or bust. I mean, it is just such an interesting dynamic for someone who was in such a prominent position prior to, which is why I do not think he would be a strong BOP nominee for Donald Trump. He might add more than sure Brian Kemp or Rand Paul or J.D. Vance, but he's not better than Glenn Youngkin or Nikki Haley. And previously, I did have them all grouped together. Ted Cruz, I'd say D, C tier. Honestly, he's probably needed in that Senate race even more. He's not likable. He is one of the most hated GOP politicians, even by his own colleagues. I mean, I really don't see much of a pathway for him in future politics outside of the state of Texas. He just simply has gotten lucky with his elections. And I think that while he did well in 2016, that's not going to translate to a potential 2016 pick. And there's a reason why Donald Trump didn't choose him in the 2016 election. Tim Scott, I think, is an A-tier candidate, potentially S-tier candidate. I'd say he probably is along the lines of Nikki Haley. Again, that idea of moderate 
policy while still capturing in the Trump base. Neither of the two are moderates by any stretch of the imagination, but the perception in American politics is everything. And I also think he balances out well, right? Having, you know, the first black VP nominee on the Republican side would be monumental. It would be a good thing for the GOP in terms of diversifying its tickets. Not only just that, though. Tim Scott has a proven track record of winning in the state of South Carolina by sometimes larger margins than Donald Trump was able to do. In 2022, Tim Scott did significantly better than Donald Trump did both in 2020 and 2016. Not to say that South Carolina is going to be competitive because it won't be, but I do think that, sure, that could translate to potentially some victories across the other uh, country, uh, across the other states. And he's not perceived as extremist. He's not perceived as crazy by members of the mainstream Republican right. I mean, they will, sure, vote for Donald Trump anyway, but I'm sure that there would be some independents, some conservative-leaning independents that would be reassured by a Tim Scott being on the ticket rather than someone like Ron DeSantis or Christy Noem or, again, all the other candidates that were mentioned before. The final two here, we have Tucker Carlson and uh, Tulsi Gabbard. It's fascinating to me that Tulsi Gabbard is even on this list. Uh, but Tucker Carlson, I think, is way overhyped. I mean, he does not add to the ticket in the way that the GOP really thinks. He's not likable. He's extremist. He has too much baggage in terms of his television history that could weigh down any candidate, congressional, Senate, governor, presidential. I mean, he is not the candidate that I think the Republican Party thinks he is. And as of right now, I would say he detracts from the Trump ticket, uh, but just ever so slightly more or less than Carrie Lake, Mike Pence, or Marjorie Taylor Greene. I think he deserves a D rating. I don't think he deserves much more than that. And even Fox News was very quick to push him out. Now for Tulsi Gabbard, I think she uniquely brings in this appeal that she did have a base on the Democratic side. Yes, she has a history of supporting Democratic policies, campaigning with Bernie Sanders, but in many people's eyes on the right, she has been perceived as this saved candidate that Democrats have lost by their wokeism, by their extremism, and that seems to be working very well. Now, Democrats hate her. I think there is a very real reality here that the voters that wanted her in 2020 would never vote for her on the presidential level now, especially as a Republican. But I do think she provides that crossover appeal maybe for independence, that she can say, I was a Democrat, became an independent because of the extremism, and now I'm running with Donald Trump to save this country because I've went on the Democratic side, I've seen the issues in the House, I've seen the issues within our party, and I tried to fix them. They pushed me out, obviously not true, but they pushed her out, and you know, this is the narrative that's going to build. I think it's a very strong one. It's a unique one that nobody else on this list can give, which is why I would give Tulsi Gabbard an A rating. She provides a level of you know, uh, balance to the ticket that I think would be unforeseen, especially in recent politics, for someone to go from a strong progressive Democrat in many people's eyes from three years ago now to being Donald Trump's VP nominee. But surprisingly enough, I think it could work. And so here's my final ratings. You have the S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, D tier, F tier. And I want to take a look at where they were 11 months ago. So here's where we were uh, around this time frame, August 2022. Nikki Haley was in the S tier. She still is. You had Ron DeSantis. Mike Pence, I had in the A tier. Tim Scott in the A tier. Christy Noem in the A tier. Paul Ryan. All of them have dropped except for Tim Scott, who has bumped up one. You can see here, Charlie Baker was in the B. No longer in consideration. Condizella Rice, no longer in consideration. Marco Rubio, no longer in consideration. Rick Scott, you know, Scott Walker, all of them out. All of them taken off the list because, quite frankly, they aren't in consideration. Uh, Candace Owens was really never in consideration. Greg Abbott, too much baggage. Larry Hogan would never be a possibility. Rand Paul's still there. Ted Cruz, still there. Uh, you know, you have the remaining list here. A bunch of people, Tucker Carlson, staying in the same fray. Uh, no Marjorie Taylor Greene, surprisingly enough, but a lot of candidates that would be pretty bad for the Trump ticket. So you can see here that there were some changes, the most notable one probably being that Ron DeSantis has fallen out of the graces of my tier list from being an S-tier candidate down to a B-tier candidate. Uh, uh, and other candidates have been propped up. Glenn Youngkin now in that good position where he's in the S tier uh, prior to. I don't even think he was on the map. So going from no one to a very strong someone is a very good point to be. And amongst the rest of these candidates, too, I think there was a very strong call for Donald Trump to have this balance to the ticket that many of them provide. But as you can see, the majority of them do not. So moving forward, we will see who Donald Trump chooses for the 2024 nomination. I will be fascinated to see who that pick is. I'm ever, you know, expecting it, starting to see leaks come through, uh, potential vets coming through. So we will see that in about 10 months. Uh, but only time will tell really who's going to be the GOP nominee for vice president. I would say, you know, for Donald Trump's sake that he chooses anywhere between the S and the B tier. But as we know, with historical choices and current choices, that Donald Trump doesn't always make the most electable decision, usually just something that benefits him personally, or that he believes would be the most beneficial decision. But generally speaking, there are very clear options that could be very good, but many bad ones that could ultimately drag down the Trump ticket more so than indictments, investigations, whatever it might be, because of the nature of the rest of these losing candidates. 
So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 GOP primary election videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.